Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, and thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch of the Hayes UK Diversity and Inclusion Report 2018. By way of brief introduction, my name is Yvonne Smythe, and I am the Group Head of Diversity and Inclusion here at Hayes. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dan Robertson, Director of the CEDA Consulting. We know Dan well, and we often collaborate with him on our DNI-led programming. Dan is a specialist diversity and organizational development consultant with substantial experience of leading organizational strategy and managing operational projects with particular expertise in organizational diagnostics, capacity building, leadership, and culture. Dan and I are going to take you through the key findings of Hayes UK Diversity and Inclusion Report and our key recommendations. I'd also like to remind you that you can type in questions at any time during the webinar, and we will spend a few minutes at the end of the webinar answering these. Before we start with the main presentation, I'd also like to quickly remind you that you can share your feedback and engage with the diversity and inclusion conversation on social media. Simply follow us on Twitter at Hayes News, or connect with us on Facebook or LinkedIn using the hashtag at diversity and inclusion. Our latest diversity and inclusion report examines the current maturity of diversity and inclusion policies, practices, and behaviors in organizations, and identifies how these can be enhanced in order to improve talent management strategies and drive all overall business success. This UK report is part of a global series of diversity and inclusion reports produced by Hayes and is based on the findings of a survey carried out in the UK, which secured over 9,300 responses. In this report, we have examined five key focus areas that we believe organizations should prioritize with strategies and action plans in order to achieve business success. These include leadership, Leaders set the tone for an open and trusting workplace and are in an ideal position to positively leverage the differing skills, experiences, and perspectives that diverse teams can offer in order to achieve improved organizational performance. Secondly, data capture and analysis. Capturing and interpreting data which measures, which measures diversity and inclusion at different stages of the employee life cycle informs the content, measurement, impact, and progress of diversity and inclusion policies and practices. Thirdly, talent attraction and selection. Broadening the pool of talent an organization hires from ensures the best possible range of candidates and access to the skills they need to succeed. Fourth, workplace culture. A culture in which all voices are encouraged to be heard and respected drives greater creativity and innovation and improves both employee productivity and retention. And finally, career management. Supporting all employees to reach their full potential improves the overall productivity and performance of an organization, and it can transform an organization and almost certainly transform a life. Of course, many of us know that Working towards a truly diverse workforce and inclusive workplace is akin to sailing towards the horizon. You feel you're getting close, but it remains stubbornly out of reach. Appropriate strategies and action plans to deliver diverse and inclusive outcomes are many and need to be tailored to the requirements and the state of readiness of each of our organizations. That said, while the circumstances and therefore the chosen priorities of each organization are unique, there are some accepted examples of best practice, which can certainly help the vast majority of organizations along. With this in mind, we have included in the report a number of practical and actionable recommendations for each of the elements we have referenced, all of which are designed to bring organizations closer to what good looks like in these areas. These recommendations are particularly important because our survey revealed that despite really positive progress being made on diversity and inclusion by many organizations, 
the lived experience of many professionals falls in some way short of the promise, potential, and benefit that these policies and practices are designed to deliver. This shortfall, if left unaddressed, may limit the success of both professionals and the organizations in which they work. Turning to leadership, a distinct feature of this shortfall often starts at the top of an organization, and our survey showed that there is a trust deficit between professionals and their organization leaders. In fact, only 35% of survey respondents stated that they trusted their organization's leaders to deliver change on the diversity and inclusion agenda. This trust deficit was even greater amongst traditionally underrepresented groups, with just 28% of black, Asian, and minority ethnic respondents, 26% who disclosed a disability, and 25% of those who believed they were treated differently at work due to their sexual orientation, stating that they trusted their leaders to deliver change on the DNI agenda. Some of the reasons behind this lack of trust to deliver change may be because over half, 58%, of survey respondents believe that their leaders have a bias towards those who look, think, or act like them, and only 34% consider their leaders to be proactive role models for championing greater diversity and inclusion. I'd like to bring Dan in for the first time now and invite him to comment further on the reasons why this lack of trust to take DNI associated action might exist. Dan, over to you. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think the numbers themselves are really quite um, stark. I think um, we at Basida Consulting uh, have recently uh, completed a significant mapping exercise uh, into the principles of inclusive leadership. And out of the eight identified competencies, trust really stood out for us as one of the key areas. I think this trust deficit, which Yvonne talks about, arises from two key areas. One is minority groups, so BME groups, LGBT groups, and disabled groups, without question, do experience some of that bias um, that Yvonne has mentioned. And we see the bias in areas such as hiring, work allocation, feedback, and progression. So I think their own experience tells them that decision making itself is biased and clearly not fair. I think there's also a second reason, actually, and my experience suggests that whilst organizational leaders do often make positive noises about diversity and inclusion, minority groups see very little change happen, um, which only serves to exaggerate this uh, trust benefit. So for us, I think there are those two reasons. One is around um, the bias themselves, and one is a disconnect between the noise and lived experience. Thank you, Dan. So, Turning now to the recommendations for this first element, in order to address this trust gap, there are certainly a few things leaders can do. First, we recommend that they invest time to become more self-aware. A good place to start is to recognize the existence and potential impact of their own unconscious biases, so they are able to mitigate any unintentional consequences these may have on the culture of their organization. There are many, many training formats to help leaders in this endeavor. They should also be willing, and perhaps for some even courageous, to seek out and understand employee sentiment towards their leadership style. Building an inclusive workplace relies upon all employees having the confidence that their opinions are heard, valued, and respected equally. Inclusive leaders can encourage this by regularly seeking opinions about their leadership style, as well as how their diversity and inclusion strategies and actions are being received by employees across all demographic groups. This can be done through regular face-to-face -face meetings, town halls, and anonymous employee feedback pulse surveys. Finally, they should actively champion and promote agreed and core diversity and inclusion initiatives. Sharing the personal, professional, cultural, and of course commercial successes which result from these will help increase employee confidence that leaders understand the importance of diversity and inclusion to individuals and the business as a whole, and that they're committed to progressing these. Dan, turning to you again, 
You are often asked to advise and coach senior executive teams on the importance of inclusive leadership and how to visibly lead from the front and role model this. What are your thoughts on how leaders can become more manifestly inclusive in the way they conduct themselves? Thanks, Yvonne. I think there are two things that leaders can do, actually. One is to use uh, organizational data. So, and I know we'll come to that theme in a moment, but really to kind of look for patterns in terms of how we see bias playing out. But I think more at a behavioral level, uh, there are a number of things that leaders can do. So the first is there's, there's a whole bunch of work around what's called the principle of amplification. And what that simply means is making sure that we amplify the voices of minority groups in their organizations. So that's about making sure that people who are different get opportunities at conference presentationals, uh, you know, they get opportunities to speak at the client pitch, and really making sure their voice is heard uh, in team meetings. Sponsorship has shown to be uh, very effective, actually, in terms of reducing some of that trust deficit which we talked about earlier. So leaders really need to go out of their way to really sponsor individuals who are different from them. And I think often what we find in some of these pool surveys is um, minority groups feel that they don't get um, honest and consistent feedback. So I think managers and leaders really need to think about those principles as well. Thanks, Dan. So turning now to the second element that we surveyed upon, data capture and analysis. Of course, in order for leaders to track and improve diversity and inclusion performance, there needs to be effective data capture and analysis. When we talk about diversity and inclusion data, we refer both to demographic diversity data, which is baseline workforce demographics across factors such as age, disability, ethnicity, gender, and where disclosed sexual orientation, as well as insights and sentiment about inclusion from an employee perspective. Our report revealed that diversity and inclusion data is not being captured consistently, nor is it being used to inform wider campaigns and investment. It was apparent from our survey that diversity data is mostly sought during or following the recruitment of new employees. Positively, 66% of survey respondents say their organization captures diversity data at the recruitment stage. However, there seems to be significantly fewer times when this diversity data and sentiment is captured during the life cycle of an employee. Only 48% say this data is captured when employees leave an organization, and just 46% say it is captured at key stages of ongoing career progression, such as promotions. Capturing this information at more regular professional and personal life stages could certainly help inform an organization's diversity and inclusion commitments and influence their progress. The minimal and often static moment in time nature of how diversity and inclusion data is often captured is reflected in the comments from our survey respondents, namely that data is not being consistently used to measure and inform wider commitments, campaigns, and programs. This perception, if left unaddressed, could lead to a downward spiral in both confidence and participation. Less than half, 43%, of respondents believe that this data is used to determine the effectiveness of diversity inclusion related policies and the fairness of people practices. This same percentage, 43%, of respondents say that they believe diversity and inclusion data is used to inform staff engagement and to make improvements to workplace culture. 42% say it is used to inform recruitment campaigns, and just 38% believe it is used to inform career development programs. So turning to the recommendations on this sector around data capture and analysis, wherever possible, organizations should seek not just demographic diversity data, but also inclusion insights from their workforce. Such qualitative data can, for example, be captured through employee surveys, which ask direct or indirect questions about perceptions of trust, transparency, fairness, and equality. 
The answers given are highly likely to offer insights missed by simple quantitative metrics, which tend to only look at the demographic profile of an organization and do not offer the opportunity to capture the true breadth and depth of insight, which is really central to the spirit of DNI and thus limit the prospects to affect significant positive change. Seeking and capturing diversity and inclusion data at different stages of the employee life cycle, such as recruitment, promotion, a return from extended absence or departure, informs and strengthens an organization's diversity and inclusion commitments as an ongoing program of sustained change. Of course, organizations should aim to ensure employees are reassured that any information gathered will be kept confidential and used ethically so as not to hinder their data collection efforts. Furthermore, although it may seem obvious that data captured should be interrogated as neutrally as possible to validate or otherwise whether diversity and inclusion policies and practices committed to thus far are in fact having a positive impact when assessed against agreed success measures. Any proven progress and successes should be purposefully and consistently referenced back to DNI objectives and communicated and celebrated by leaders throughout the organization to encourage all employees' understanding of the many personal and professional advantages that a diverse workforce and inclusive workplace can bring. Finally, remember that diversity and inclusion data can be used to enhance a range of campaigns and programs. For example, inclusion insights can offer new ways to enhance workplace culture and employee engagement, and demographic diversity data can highlight if there is an issue with the recruitment and progression of employees from traditionally under, underrepresented groups. So Dan, quite a lot there. What are your thoughts and recommendations on effective ways in which dynamic and real-time sentiment around inclusion in particular can be captured, analysed and actioned. Yeah, thanks Yvonne. R really interesting actually and um, participants may know already that um, there's been lots of work from Harvard University from behavioural science saying that data capture is probably the most significant um, piece of uh, information which organisations have in terms of really making sure that diversity and inclusion is seen as a strategic um, um, fourth. I think from an inclusion perspective, there are two key things. One we've touched on already, which is employee engagement surveys are a great way of tapping into this sense of belonging for all employees, particularly minority groups. Many of your organizations will have um, employee resource groups. Employee resource groups are often an underutilized resource in organizations. So I would hope that organizations would have a dual strategy, particularly when you're making decisions around where it's implementing a new policy or process. So yes, use your employee engagement survey, but use your ERGs as a way to really influence policies and processes, and that will give you uh, more of a sense in terms of uh, where you're going. Thanks, Dan. So moving now to the third element that we surveyed on, namely talent attraction and selection, a topic very close to Hayes Heart. Businesses which are proactive in sourcing diverse candidates are more likely to attract talent from a wider variety of demographics and sources, giving them access to a broader pool of talent and skills. This is particularly vital in these times of acute skills shortages. Even with organizations which are taking positive steps to attract diverse talent, there seems to be a lack of thoroughness and consistency in their approach to this, with a number of stones left unturned. For example, while over two-thirds, 68%, of those we surveyed believe that the words their organization uses to describe their vacancies and culture are unbiased, less than half, 48%, state the imagery and branding in their recruitment materials reflects the diverse workforce. And while there will of course be a particular personal perspective attached to this, just 38% say their organization is proactive in its efforts to source what we called in the survey diverse candidates. There 
a similar lack of thoroughness and consistency towards taking positive action to audit and maintain diversity of profiles during the talent selection process. Positively, the majority, 84%, of respondents say their organizations mitigate bias in the recruitment processes by implementing structured interviews. And a significant minority, 26%, say their organization has introduced name-blind recruitment when deciding on a candidate to hire, which is actually quite a high figure, considering, considering the investment that needs to be made in order to implement this, and very often a change in process. However, further methods which could help foster an even more inclusive talent selection process are not being so readily used, even though they would be relatively easy to introduce and facilitate. For example, only about a third, 34%, of respondents said that their organization ensures interview panels are diverse. Surely this is a quick win. If the potentially significant risk of conscious or unconscious deselection on the part of the potential employer or potential employee was properly understood. So turning now to the recommendations in this section, how can you ensure that you reap the benefits of accessing and recruiting from a more diverse talent pool? Well, first, re-examine your recruitment materials. Recruitment marketing assets and job descriptions offer a perfect opportunity to make a strong first impression with a wide pool of candidates. It is therefore important that these portray your organization as being positively committed to diversity and inclusion principles and values. Review all your recruitment materials for the banana skins of language and imagery, which may unwittingly reinforce gender, age, ethnicity, or other stereotypes. You should work with an expert recruiter who understands how to attract talent from the widest talent pool consciously including underrepresented groups. Not only will this help you attract talent by positioning your organization as having a welcoming environment for all, but it will help you actively source talent from the widest possible pool, both vital considerations in today's skills short and competitive recruitment market. It is also important to mitigate bias when reviewing CVs. Remember to do this throughout the talent selection process by involving a range of diverse stakeholders when reviewing and selecting candidates. Also, where possible, consider blind decision making when shortlisting candidates to ensure that selection is based on core essential skills and competencies only. You can do this by removing one or more elements of personal information from the CVs before review such as a candidate's name and possibly even education. Also, trim job and person specifications to reflect essential skills, competencies, and aptitude, as opposed to a wish list linked to attainment and same mold profiles. Finally, diversify your interview panel. Using a group interview process made up of a diverse panel with different perspectives and demographic profiles represented can support an inclusive selection process favorable for both the hiring organization and the candidate. So Dan, turning to you, there are a number of recommended actions here. Is there anything else you would advise employers to do in consciously incorporating an inclusive tone when recruiting talent as opposed to perceiving this positive action as targeting one profile to the detriment of another. Thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, actually, really a good solid set of recommendations there. I think a number of points to make is, is one is um, recruiting diverse candidates is not a zero-sum game. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar, but just a reminder of, of the business case, you know, research from people like Boston Consulting Group and Cloverpop tell us that when we have diversity and inclusivity in our organizations, it absolutely leads to higher levels of uh, organizational innovation. And that's followed through by research from McKinsey, which talks about organizational profitability. Just to add on to some of the recommendations which you've made already, 
Um, as well as working with specialist recruitment agencies, we would say work with um, partners who are specialists in diversity recruitment, such as Elevation Networks, who focus on BME recruitment. Some other suggestions include, are you, are you using specialist AI programs to screen out bias in your shortlisting uh, processes, such as Textio uh, and others? Uh, we would recommend actually using uh, group interview processes um, and following preset questions, because we know that when we follow preset questions, uh, bias is less likely to creep in. Um, do you use a scoring system, and do you aggregate scores before debriefing of a candidate? Because aggregated scores, again, has shown to have quite a significant impact in terms of mitigating some of those uh, biases that we've talked about. And as well as having diversity on your interview panels, we would encourage you to introduce what many organizations are now calling a devil's advocate within the process. And that's somebody whose role is there to challenge, critique, and really make sure that decision making is fair and free from bias. Thank you, Dan. So now turning to the fourth element that we surveyed upon, um, workplace culture. Effective diversity and inclusion policies, practices, and behaviors can also foster a positive workplace culture which helps you retain talent and unlock the full potential of your workforce. There's a well-known and often used analogy that is used by those looking to articulate the difference between diversity and inclusion. And it is one that also works well when we talk about workplace culture. The analogy is diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. Well, extending the dance analogy just for a moment, we are seeing increasing recognition of the vital part culture plays in getting as many people as possible to throw their best shapes on the dance floor. This represents the social fabric of a workforce and workplace. At Hayes, I tend to call this the glue, and this is a major factor which can positively influence discretionary effort, loyalty, and productivity. Looking at our survey findings, which reflect the current state, the good news is that nearly two-thirds of survey respondents, 63%, state that diversity and inclusion is promoted in their organization's staff communications, and over half, 59%, say that their organization supports key diversity and inclusion events, such as multicultural religious observance, International Women's Day, Pride, and Mental Health Awareness Week. However, our research shows that whilst diversity is frequently celebrated at an organizational level, individual employees don't always feel like they are being heard. Only 41% of respondents say they believe they work in a culture that encourages debate and diversity of thought, some really fundamental elements of DNI. Furthermore, less than half 43% of survey respondents say that they believe their voice is heard and respected. This sentiment was, even, was, was felt even more acutely amongst those who felt they were disadvantaged at work during, uh, due to their sexual orientation at 36%, um, BAME, and disabled respondents, of whom only 32% felt that their voice was heard and respected. So looking at our recommendations when we look at culture, organizations should continue to be mindful of and look for suitable opportunities to acknowledge and celebrate events and activities which reflect the varied backgrounds and cultures of its workforce and perhaps also the community in which it operates. Prompts and suggestions for these often come from within an organization at grassroots community level. Listen out for these and if a decision is made to acknowledge and celebrate these, ensure the opportunity to participate in something different is consciously offered and inclusive to all. This helps encourage understanding, awareness, and acceptance of all employees, and in turn, fosters greater communication and collaboration between employees. Encourage debate and celebrate diversity of thought on an individual level. Work towards a goal where all employees feel confident that their voices are respected and valued. This can be achieved by actively soliciting ideas and feedback from employees on different issues 
through organization-wide surveys, one-to-one -one meetings with leaders and influencers, or hosting collaborative round table discussions with mixed groups before following up with clearly defined actions. One last recommendation here is to further unlock innovative thinking by encouraging an environment where everyone's ideas are not only heard but also celebrated. This can be done by promoting the business successes of those employees who have driven innovation by thinking outside the box which will encourage other employees to do the same. All of this should be wrapped and underpinned by a deliberate and purposeful communication from the organization's leaders. So Dan, turning to you, if I may, on this increasingly hot topic, can I ask you for your views on two things? The first question is, what has been the trigger which has resulted in us now aligning culture so much more closely to the DNI narrative? And the second question that I have for you is, given that an inclusive culture is something that, work, that workers want and actively seek out, how do organizations support the challenge that this survey poses, namely that driving the experience of an inclusive culture needs to move from organizational down to individual level? Thanks, Yvonne. I think there's a couple of things to think about there. If we just take the first question, and I'll just share a statistic with everybody, is that the LinkedIn uh, Global Recruitment Index 2018 found that 57% uh, of organizations are now looking at how they can promote a sense of belonging. And the reason that they're doing that is because the voices of minority groups are often undervalued, underutilized, and in some cases ignored. This falls into um, something which Daniel Pink uh, talks about in his book, Drive, which is that um, not just minority groups, but all of us in organizations are looking for a sense of having a voice. Um, we're looking for a sense of how can we as employees have some uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose in our organizations. And I think these themes around belonging, mastery, and purpose, and voice really fall into this notion of um, promoting an inclusive uh, work culture. So there's some of the big things which organizations need to think about. I think in terms of what um, um, organizations can do at the individual level, for me it actually goes back to some of the things that we were talking about previously in terms of um, you can only do when we go back to some of those principles of amplification. So if I am LGBT disabled or from a BME group, do I get the speaking slots at team meetings? Do I get the speaking slots at town hall events? Do I get the speaking slots at, at, at conferences? Do I feel a sense of sponsorship from those leaders in my organization? Or do I see people who are different from me and in the majority group getting the sponsorship? Do I feel that I'm getting honest and consistent feedback? I think there's also something quite fundamental about role modeling, so making sure leaders role model inclusivity um, you know, in, in the way that they uh, try and move their strategy. So one is questioning. The so question, for instance, all male conference panels or client uh, team meetings um, and introduce the notion of what's called blind ideas sharing so bias and fall into that process. Thank you, Dan. Turning now to the final element that we surveyed upon, um, proactive career management. Whilst the reality of a good workplace culture is both a group and an individual play, the fifth and final element that we explored in our survey and report fundamentally happens at the individual level. Effective career management helps to build and sharpen relevant skills and experiences of employees and if managed well, directly benefits both the individual and the organization. Looking at this vital ingredient, our survey surfaced a commonly expressed concern that many professionals perceive that there are still barriers to career progression as a result of factors which sit outside of core considerations of competence, attitude, aptitude, and merit. Over half, 57%, of our survey respondents said that there have been occasions where their chances for career progression have been limited 
because of their age, gender, ethnicity, disability, or sexual orientation. Taking the same challenge, but looking at it through a different but related lens, 43% of survey respondents state that they believe they are more likely to be promoted if they have a similar socioeconomic background to their organization's management. We've taken a number of cuts of this data, and we see that 57% of respondents who believe that their progression has been limited due to their background. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that because that's not clear. So we've taken a number of cuts of the data, and 57% of respondents believe that their progression had been limited um, due to their background. And looking at that a little bit more closely, the specific characteristics cited were 50% believe that this was due to their age, 41% due to their gender, 40% their ethnicity, 11% their disability, and 8% due to their sexual orientation. Cutting the data again shows us that certain demographic groups are more likely to believe that their career progression has been limited when directly compared to other comparator groups. For example, 68% of all BME respondents say that their progression has been limited due to their ethnicity compared to just 8% of white British respondents. 36% of all female respondents say that their career progression has been limited due to their gender, compared to only 9% of all male respondents. 48% of, of all respondents who disclose a disability say that their progression has been limited due to their disability. 44% of all respondents aged over 55 say their progression has been limited due to their age. So looking at the recommendations on some of these quite stark numbers, most organizations, of course, would be quick to refute any suggestion that their employees' progression is significantly or even in part limited due to gender, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, disability, or socioeconomic background. However, the sentiment expressed by our survey respondents is a perfect illustration of where perception can become a reality. On the basis that these perceptions do exist amongst the majority of employees, employers need to take steps to build an environment where employees can feel confident in expressing concerns like this. There should be a process in place for sentiment to be listened to, noted, responded to, and acted upon in a measured and appropriate way. Employees should also have clearly defined progression pathways and transparent objectives, so they are aware their personal career progression is tied to specific aspects of their performance, which will only be assessed on merit. Additionally, certain policies can help progression opportunities, ensure that progression opportunities are inclusive to all employees. For example, flexible working opportunities will allow all employees to better manage the demands of work and personal life while still fulfilling professional responsibilities. Initiatives such as mentoring and sponsorship programs are a useful way to provide traditionally underrepresented groups with access to leadership development opportunities. Finally, training at managerial level with a clear reference to the impact of unconscious bias at, team, at key times of selection should be a priority. These can have a positive effect of removing some of the actual and perceived obstacles to career progression experienced by employees and support more employees to reach their full professional potential. So Dan, you're recognized as one of the world's leading experts on the existence and the impact of unconscious bias. We know it is one of the major causes for inequality of access and progression in the workplace. Looking at career management and career progression in particular, what is your advice on how the impact of unconscious bias can be mitigated in this regard? 
Thanks, Yvonne. Um, I think there's a number of things, actually. One is that we know that unconscious bias does result in organizational trends and patterns. So one of the things, actually, that I would encourage organizations to do, even though we're talking about um, career management, is just think about those one or two steps uh, prior, which leads to that uh, conversation. So look for trends and patterns based on things like gender, disability, ethnicity, in terms of who gets the stretching work, who gets the work allocation. Um, there's lots of work going on, interestingly, in law firms at the moment around utilization. So utilization data based on gender, and that's actually informing career management uh, conversations. So I think about using your data to, to do all, all of that. The other thing which I would uh, ask you to think about beyond the system process, if you like, is just some of those everyday behaviors which are really aligned to the theme of culture that we've been talking about today. You know, lots of women do continue to talk about, you know, the old boys club, uh, the behaviors that go on under the radar, the not spoken activity, you know, those unwritten rules, who gets invited to the ski trip. You know, some of these um, softer things, if you like, have a greater impact in terms of people's um, careers. So I think a dual process of things like utilization data, um, as well as the behavioral things, um, we'd like to um, really like to get some investigation in terms of, in terms of what's happening. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm delighted to say we're keeping to time, which is great. Um, that means we've got some time for some questions, because that really takes us to the end of the formal part of the presentation. We've got a few questions that have come up, and I'll relay them back in, um, and we'll comment on those, and then we'll let you know how you get a copy of the slides, et cetera, et cetera. So just having a look at some of the questions that have come in. Um, I can see here a question, Dan. Perhaps you can have a look at it. Um, how do you create clear pathways for progression in a small organization where it is unlikely to be able to promote from within? Well, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, I think there are a couple of things, actually, in terms of the career pathway for progression uh, in small organizations. Um, well, I suppose there's a couple of things there. Is First of all, um, when we talk about progression, I think it's about saying, well, Who's in that discussion pot, actually? And I would actually encourage organizations really to take a step back and say, um, how is it that certain people end up in that conversation and others don't? So I would go back to, are you really making sure you're giving honest and consistent feedback to everybody? Does everyone get the um, work opportunities? Those informal relationships, the informal mentoring, the informal sponsorship. They're the things that really dictate who starts to kind of move up the organizational pipeline um, and who doesn't. Um, if you're in a small organization, you might have limited scope for that. I suppose the response to that would be then if you are hiring laterals, um, I suppose it really goes back to the hiring process, you know, making sure you're looking for difference um, uh, within uh, your hiring process. I think the principles are pretty much the same actually, whether it's a small organization or whether it's a large organization. Thanks, Dan. Uh, another question here, which I'll take. Why is it important to capture diversity information during the life cycle if it is being, oh, it's just disappeared. Uh, if it's being caught, I think, yes, if it's being caught during recruitment, surely you already have it. Um, this, I think the key point here is that when we talk about data, we're talking about um, diversity and inclusion. So the quantitative, um, you know, could well be at, and demographic certainly in the majority of cases would be caught um, at, uh, you know, at point of recruitment. But the um, data around the sense of inclusion and the sentiment around that, which is absolutely essential, um, certainly is not captured at point of recruitment because it's not a lived experience yet. So to capture that um, and really extend the definition of what we mean by data is absolutely, um, absolutely essential, and uh, you need to have the two going uh, hand in hand. Um, yes, Dan, do you want to add to that? I think the other thing is actually, even with the hard data, when we're capturing hard data at the recruitment stage, that data tells us who's coming into the organization. But what it doesn't tell us is who's moving up the organizational pipeline. 
So we do need some hard data on diversity in terms of some of the principles that Yvonne was talking about earlier. So, you know, returners, for example, um, hard data around how many men and women we have um, in the organizational hierarchy, those sorts of metrics will influence how we develop our leadership development competences, who gets sponsorship and the rest. So I think the data scenario is not just one around attraction and hiring, it informs who goes, moves up the pipeline and the rest of it. Great, thank you very much. Um, Dan, I've got one more question actually that's come in, which I'd like you to um, respond to, because I think it really is important, which is this concept of inclusive leadership. Um, and it's something that I think some leaders are almost fearful of, of changing their behavior in a way that perhaps doesn't feel comfortable. Could you just talk about, once again, just talk about why inclusive leadership is just so important? And that's leadership at everyone who is a de facto leader, not just the top tier. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, I think the basic... Um, uh, the basic headlines are simply this. Um, most organizations, whether they're large or small, have two big, really strategic assets. One asset is your customer base, and the other asset is your talent. And we know that our customer base and our talent is becoming increasingly diverse. So when we talk to professors at Harvard University, they tell us that the global landscape is defined by certain factors. So it's defined by complexity, uncertainty, uh, organization, technological disruption. But the other factor they constantly talk about is diversity. We know that with leadership, leadership is basically confined by a traditional model. And that model of leadership generally tends to be male. It tends to be individualistic, so the one leader knows best. It tends to be very hierarchical. And what that creates is a dynamic of leadership where Leaders are often in, um, in, in silos in organizations, so they don't connect with the vast majority of their workforce. They generally start to connect with people that look, sound, and think like them. And when you connect with people that look, sound, and think like you, it's very difficult for you to be close, A, to your major asset, which is your talent, but also it's very difficult to be close to your customer base. So the point and the principle of inclusive leadership which is about saying, are we aware of our own biases? How can we make sure we flex our style so that we can connect with the diversity of our talent? The outcome of that process is to make sure we're close to the diversity within the global market space. So inclusive leadership is not just about um, you know, being nice to people. It's about smart decision-making, what I would call building your cultural intelligence as an organizational leader. Thanks, Dan. Um, we've got time to take one more question, which I'll, which I'll pick up on. And I'm conscious that there are uh, a lot of questions that have come in. It's great to see you also actively engaged. Um, I will take um, a, a copy of these, and we will respond to everyone uh, directly or the questions you've asked if we haven't had a chance to respond to them. Um, but the, the other one I'm just going to pick up, because I think it, it, it's an umbrella point, is um, you talk a lot about the importance of communication. How can my organization better communicate diversity and inclusion initiatives and successes? So thank you for that question. Um, purposeful communication plays a really vital role in signposting, evidencing, and reinforcing an organization's commitment to DNI and i um, and linking that to kind of the personal and commercial successes that result from it. So, the way it is delivered and importantly labeled just can't be left to chance. So ideally, communication should be planned in consultation with the leaders of the business and delivered by them in their, in their tone of voice so it sounds, it sounds authentic. Um, it could be an article placed on a global intranet, a company-wide email, um, but it's really important that all employees are made aware that this is linked to a commitment to DNI and it isn't just an example of best practice and isolation, um, and also making any links um, to successes that have come from it, either personal or professional. So um, that's, I think, the questions for now. As I say, if we haven't had a chance to answer your question, we will respond to you directly on Monday on that. Um, just looking at uh, a few more logistics, um, 
before we give the detail of how to get the report. Um, so I just really wanted to flag a couple of additional resources over and above this report that uh, we have uh, created um, here at Hayes, which we are confident uh, you will find useful on your journey here. Um, the first one is a candidate journey diagnostic tool, um, which is an online tool um, to help organizations improve their, ta their candidate experience. It's been created by our um, global talent solutions business um, and really is, um, it really is rather fabulous actually. It's an interactive tool that allows you to evaluate how strong your candidate experience is against industry leading best practice across six key assessment stages. It's based on your self, on your self assessment and specific goals, and once you input those, the tool automatically provides a rating against your answers and creates a personalized report of recommendations on how to take your candidate experience to the next level. The bespoke report that you'll get will benchmark your candidate experience score to help you identify what makes a winning candidate experience, how to take your candidate experience to the next level and areas of priority, quick wins, and ideas for continuous improvement. So that's around the candidate experience, which is obviously pretty close to our core business here at Hayes, and the talent attraction um, element of the report. Um, you can access the tool on hayes.co.uk slash candidate experience, as you can see on the slide in front of you. The second asset, we're actually giving you a bit of a sneak preview of, um, and we're also confident that you're going to really find this helpful. Um, this is an inclusive recruitment checklist that um, Dan and I actually have been working very closely on, and in his comments on the um, talent attraction um, element of, of this presentation, he's already started to allude to some of the really um, fabulous shortcuts and, and resources that you can use. So it's Hayes in, in partnership with Vecina Consulting. Um, the checklist lays out a step-by-step -step, um, series of instructions and recommendations to help you build a more inclusive recruitment process. And you can uh, shortly request your copy from our website landing page, um, hayes.co.uk slash DI checklist, and we'll be happy to introduce you and talk you through this valuable tool. So, there's a couple of extra things. Um, coming back to the main purpose of this webinar and a copy of uh, the guide and this, this report and its recommendations and indeed the context setting by a number of subject matter experts um, against the five elements, including Dan. I hope you found today's session uh, a useful insight into diversity and inclusion in the world of work today and how you can improve your organization's own policies practices and behaviors, and indeed become more self-aware as you are progressing through your own careers. At this stage, if you would like to request a copy of the report, please speak to your usual Hayes contact or complete the form on our web page, which is listed there on the screen, hayes.co.uk slash DI report. We would be delighted to provide you with further, further consultancy and advice on this increasingly front and center topic. So that's how you get the report. Um, you request a copy, um, you infill your details, and then we basically make sure you get a copy, and we're very happy to follow up with some uh, personalized conversations. So I think we've kept time. My, finally, my, my thanks go to Dan, uh, Dan Robertson at Vasita Consulting for sharing his expertise with us today, um, and to all of you for taking the time to join us on this webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy reading the report when you get it, and enjoy the weekend ahead. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.